Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. Welcome everyone to Big Questions with the Dead Milkman. This week, we're going to talk about our memories of making what is argue, arguably the best album that any band has ever made ever, Metaphysical Graffiti, argue, I say arguably, um, and uh, Dan can either make up his own memories or uh, talk about his memories of listening to it, or, and, and he can in interrupt us anytime with questions if he wants. Um, I'll start. A uh, little background, uh, that a lot of changes happened to the band after, behind the scenes, after um, Beelzebub was released. Um, one of them being that we were, our, our, it's, our contract with Fever Records expired, and Fever didn't want to be a record company anymore, so we couldn't renew it even though we were the most successful artist on his label. It was Colin Cotcat. One, one guy's label by the end. It used to be two guys' labels. An economics experiment. An economics yeah. He was a professor at Wharton. You may remember that. And then he wanted to be a shepherd. So he had to shut everything down. And he put, the, he put the rights to our records up for sale, but they were way too pricey for us. Unfortunately to me, I was sad about that. Uh, but they were bought by Enigma, and that's who we decided to do a deal with directly, Enigma Records, for for that the next... I think we did a seven-record deal, but we only got one record out of it. And that was called Metaphysical Graffiti. Another thing that happened behind the scenes was <clears throat> Dave Reckner asked to dissolve the Dead Milkman Partnership. He used to be our partner up until then, but um, he made his own company. This is messy stuff uh business wise but he had his own production company and he wanted us to be a client of that production company for to make accounting easier and all this and all that so he went he was no longer um going to split everything five ways he wasn't going to be a, the fifth member in other words so we had we had to make a new company which we which is when we made dm music incorporated so we had a lot of lawyer, lawyering. We, sub lawyer we submitted a lot of rather um, interesting names, and a lot of them kept getting rejected because. Well, you're not allowed. We found out you're not allowed to have dead in an incorp in in a, an incorporated company in the state of Pennsylvania, and that's where we incorporated. Um. <laughs> so that that happened. <laughs> Uh, Rodney started playing keyboards for the band in the Beelzebub tour, which was good for our sound. It fleshed it out. Um, I was, a, I didn't, I only learned that Rodney had an interest in playing keyboards until after Beelzebub was recorded. And he, he uh, started practicing with the keyboards at practice and even started submitting music instead of just lyrics. For an example, on um, this album, the Bay Sunshine song is Rodney's music and lyrics, at least the first part of it. And then, right? Am I, I don't know. Am I going crazy? That's what I remember. I think we all wrote this. Well, I wrote you can't pin this on me, Joe. <laughs> you remember this. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you had um, the, uh, If You Love Somebody, Set Them On yeah, Fire. If You Love Somebody, Set Them On Fire, Rodney wrote for his uh, project, uh, cassette project called um sunflower children of god 2000 bong hits from whom <laughs> which you got a copy of and i begged him to let us <laughs> he begged you i begged him. <laughs> so, I, I said please like can that be a dead milkman song i think well, I, in, in the original I, I, dead had milkman, I was sitting around i had just a bunch of people hanging around one weekend and i we was talking about the other bands that had become the dead milkman in joe's mythology and there was one i was fascinated with called the sunflower children of god who had a keyboard player named richard nixon who died and his head fell on the keyboards and so there's this droning in the back of one so, so i said that what i should do is over the course of a weekend drink a lot richard nixon was in okay yeah so, okay richard nixon was part of the dead milkman mythology because oh yeah yeah so i thought he i didn't know he made it, to it was, the book, but it was sunflower, sunflower children of god. god were a precursor band to the dead milkman yeah. 
Yeah, so I, I said I should, since this album, Joe had never bothered to make this album. He made some of the other albums, like the Deeks brothers and stuff like that, who existed in the mythology. I was sitting around a group of people, and I said, let me see how much I can drink in one weekend and if I can make an album. So that's where the Sunflower Children of God album came from. It is horrendously bad. Right. Yeah, I think the sun shines out my like, assholes on that album. Yes, the sunshine. That's <laughs> what on that album, too. That would become base sunshine. Well, also, I moved from Germantown right after uh, Beelzebub was recorded because Dean, mo Dean moved and Dan and Dave didn't want to leave that apartment that he had with Dean. So he he didn't beg me or twist my arm, but I had to think about it because I was kind of having a good time in Germantown. And I but then, you know, I didn't have to do the commute to to be with Dave and write songs or so. It went so i took over i guess dean's room and dean moved to another place is that um, when you moved in with melissa yeah that's when you moved in with melissa and we i the, i remember writing rodney we still had lyrics from rodney uh i think the little, the little man in my head was the first thing i wrote with dave at that apartment that i remember doing even before the album, even before Beelzebub came out, but then we had more writing sessions later. But most of that time that I was living in the apartment with Dave, we were on tour made for Beelzebub. And we he renewed the lease to that place because you had to you had to renew the lease two months in advance instead of like a lot of leases, they just renew on their own if you don't do anything but not at this place because <laughs> it was university city housing and that's how they did it because they they had they were mostly catering to university kids students um but then he even after he he's he renewed it then just had a change of mind and decided to move out of the city so he kind of left me there with the lease in my own place so we he had to come to me I mean, I went out to his place, but he didn't want any music to be played there because of he, he, neighbors and stuff. So uh, he came out to me and we, but we didn't have as much songwriting time as I imagined we would have. And I think our friendship kind of was kind of deteriorating because I had arguments with him about certain business things and the money that we were spending on the lawyers to, to get our company together. So we weren't in the best of... <laughs> Was that the Melville Street house? Yeah, the Melville Street house. Okay. But still, to, so I, I basically what I'm saying is I ended up writing a lot of the stuff that Roddy wrote lyrics for just on my own. And then Dave would just come by and learn the part. So that's a little bit of the difference. But Rodney also was contributing to music. I, I don't know who wrote Anderson, Walkman, Bottles, and How. I thought maybe Rodney did that one all by himself, too. But There's, there's a huge backstory to that song. When we get to me, <laughs> when, when we get, get to me, I'll, um, give you the, I'll give you the backstories on, on Methodist Coloring Book, Do the Brown Nose, uh, If You Love Somebody, Set Them on Fire, and Anderson, Walkman, Buttholes, and How. I also thought that R.C.'s mom was on this album, but it isn't. No, I was hoping no we, we, we kind of skipped that. over yeah. that, for that. That was on the last one, yeah. R.C.'s mom was, was a song that Dave originated uh, through a his bass riff and I worked on it through him and the lyrics come out came out later and the reason it was called that was because it was RC's mob that RC or mob, crescent mob was yeah. or crescent mob was their nickname was RC mob yeah I wanted to just write a song from perspective it was completely <laughs> blunt uh what happened was um James Brown had, had got caught beating his wife or, or that was or in the news thing, and everybody was defending him so I thought this would be like the equivalent of well now we didn't know them but like uh gary glitter going going to touch your kids hey and i thought just make it so horrible and in your face and i've learned since then the subtlety i'll go with subtlety from now on okay. people thought i was actually pro yeah i should have so mentioned, book mentioned that, this last time but i'm just catching up now i had lyrics that rodney wrote hand, by hand on paper for methodist coloring book i wrote music to it i Kind of wrote it thinking he would sing it. Um, part three was another one that had lyrics first. I wrote music to it. Then I tripped over the Ottoman Sane deal. The Big Sleazy, I don't remember how the music came about for that. I did not originate it. Was it, if it wasn't uh, Dean, then I guess it that means it was Dave. 
um, dollar signs in her eyes was only me. I wrote that, but that the that the inspiration for that was I was so worried about money and losing all our money in these deals that I didn't think we're <laughs> going to work out. Um, that I was losing sleep, and I just just eventually came to the conclusion that I I was the one with the dollar signs worrying about money too much, and I. I, I just wrote it from the third person point of view and called it's easier to do it that way. It's more distance because do dollar signs in my eyes just didn't work out too well lyrically. In praise of Shanana, again, that was lyrics ahead of time that I just wrote music to. Like I don't know. Which was contradicted in the last episode when Dean said that somebody other than Shanana stabbed that guy at Altamont. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the comment section. You, know, you gotta be watching these videos to keep track of what's going on. Yeah, and keep in mind though, if you follow Stephen King, and this is no joke, the dead milkmen are often used to indicate an alternate universe. I'm not joking. This is a real thing. So sometimes it's something we reference to the dead milkmen where we're a good band, other times we're a bad band, and things will happen at different dates. Uh on his on Castle Rock posters were used for things. So I'm just saying it, it may have happened in the alternate dead milk. Men universe or Stephen King universe. That's real. <laughs> and um now everybody's me again. That was um oh I don't I don't really remember what the order of that one was. Um Epic Tales of Adventure. Do, 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 do. That started with a uh Dave a Dave riff and we we together worked on the music for that and then Rodney put put lyrics to it in the aftermath of that music. And that's pretty much it. I noticed that Little Man in the Head never made it to the to the artwork on the cover. I don't know why. If that was yeah, I think it was an error in printing. <laughs> we, did, we did that on purpose or not. So it was kind of like a hidden track. You want a fun and, fact? And then I'm going to... Uh, what's that? My my wife thought that was a Ween song when we met. <laughs> She's like, I like... She was, I, I, I don't like the Dead Milk Punk. Have, you have that song, Push the Little Daisies. But this is one of our one of our states. I like Ween because they have that song "Little Man" in my head, and I'm like, I got something to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> and I I had a lot. We've of been arguing ever since because we when we recorded it, I don't know whose idea it was. It wasn't my idea, but uh, someone had the idea. Maybe it was Brian Beatty, the producer, to do a dub. A live dub mix. So there was no, there's no other mix other than the dub mix that you hear on that. And we did it in, in the old fashioned way of cutting up his assistant engineer actually cut up the tape. And we, we all had fun work putting effects on different things beforehand, beforehand. So that there's a really long version of that with like he, Brian would, put effects on something, print it with the effects, rewind it, put some more different effects on a part. So you could have a, like a whole album side of just that song if you wanted to edit it that way. But then some, his assistant took, like, listen to everything and picked out the best, what he thought were the best parts. And then we all had a hand in assembling them into a dub mix. So that was fun. That took a long time and it was fun. And we did have an extra long time to make this record. We had a bigger budget than we ever had. We went back to Arlen Studios. Now, we we probably already in our mind chose Brian. I don't know if Brian realized that we would want to choose him, but I think Dave Blood was most comfortable with working with him, and that would be easy. But we did have the chance to maybe make a record with Rick Rubin, because that's who the record company Enigma wanted us to make the record with. And they even... Uh, hooked us up with him to meet after one of our shows in Los Angeles. So we got to chat with Rick Rubin and talk about music for a little while. And that was neat. But in, in the, in the end, we didn't tell him no right then and there, but I think in our minds, we thought, Oh, we already have a producer in, 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 in mind. I remember that we didn't drive, we didn't drive to, to, we did this in January, uh, the whole month of January in, um, Austin, we flew out, but I think we, we had a, a, a road manager by, uh, well, Dan Matt was our road manager. I think Dan flew out with us, but, um, a tech, a road, te a stagehand road tech named Matt, you know, Matt Dubin, which we got, which was a friend of Dave Blood's 
from Bur from Burlington. No, um, Bennington. B Bennington, not Burlington, Bennington. But thank you. Who was a friend of a, a close friend of Dave's girlfriend at the time. She went, Dave's girlfriend went to Bennington. Um, a college there in, in Vermont. And he drove uh I think he drove our van with all of our gear. So he started out ahead of time, then we flew and all met there. So we had our van there, but we didn't have to spend time on the road. And instead of staying in that cool house, it wasn't available that we stayed at with Beelzebub. We stayed at a residence inn. <laughs> <laughs> we had... We each had a roommate, but we had, it's a suite, so there were, we could we didn't have to be in the same room together with our roommate. I drank a lot of loose tea, and this is the residence in where somebody thought my loose tea was something else and took it. Uh, one of the one of the cleaners. Oh, one of the maids. Now, we had to leave a note behind saying, don't smoke that. Whatever you do, it'll give you like a horrible <laughs> headache. We had to ask a doctor what would happen. If you, and particularly, I, I am a big fan of like really strong loose tea. So it'd be like worse than smoking regular, you know, for you jazz folks who call it tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was my first time and only time that I lived in a hood in a motel for like five weeks <laughs> whatever <laughs> time we um we rehearsed in the studio for i don't know what is it a couple days or so but but it was in a part of the studio that was owned by the studio by then but not they were renovate they were adding to the studio a whole new room so there so when beelzebub was recorded this wasn't part of arlen studios it was just the building it was in the building <laughs> and they opened it up but it was like i think dean mentioned in a previous episode how it was not insulated it was a big big open room and now it's now in arlen studios it's it's finished and it's part of like the second studio they have in the whole complex yeah arlen studios um and that's where Methodist Coloring Book was recorded. Um, Brian made a list of all the songs he wanted the drum sounds for in that room, the big, big open room, and all the drums and all the songs he wanted the drum sounds for in the regular studio. And so we, that's how we recorded them. We first set up in the regular part of the studio and recorded a bunch, and then we moved to the other part. And as for songs for warming up that weren't ours, I think we did Rudy Can't Fail. And we did. Oh, no, um, message to you, Rudy. Oh, that's right. Not the Clash song. A message to you, Rudy. That's the song I meant to say. And some other song about Rock and Roll Queen, was it? Rock and Roll Queen, you know what? A I David mean? Bowie song, yeah. A, a, Dave, Mott the Hoople song. Mott the Hoople song, right. Yeah. So those were our uh, extras. Um, that's 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 kind of what I, I remember having a lot of fun making it. Um, but there was a lot of frustration in preparing for it when we, um, but when, when we were, when we were doing it in earnest, like getting all of our, our rehearsals done and making our own demos, they were on four track. We did four track demos at every rehearsal <laughs> of whatever we did. And we actually did demos of the songs that the, the improvised songs that we called Earl's that were, I forget what we call them. They're interspersed throughout the album. But the idea for that was, we noticed when we were making Beelzebub that there was a lot of unused tape that uh, the, the two inch tape, 24 track tape, because we would, we would do like three takes of a song and use, for example, take three, then the two, the two previous takes to save to save money, we would just erase, go rewind and, and record over that. Hopefully not recording over the track that the, the songs that we wanted to keep, which I think happened maybe once. <laughs> but um, now we were going to be very careful and not do that ever again. But so I don't know whose idea it was, if it was Brian's or one of our ideas to just jam to, 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 take those 
little snippets of tape that could never be used because they weren't long enough for a song and do the little Earl jams in those. And every now and then while we're recording, Brian would say, hey, do you guys want to do an Earl? We have um, a minute and two, three seconds of tape. And he would give us a signal when it was like 10 seconds left of the tape so that because he was going to stop it no matter what and that would give dave uh or dean i guess dean the dean could see him through the glass and and give us the cue to to end it and that's how we did those we did a lot of them but we just picked the best you still have any of the ones you didn't use They're on <clears throat> that. they should be on that well interesting you asked dan uh just tonight Dave Reckner, our manager, came down to see me and he delivered a whole van load of two inch master tapes from the past 35 years. So they're now in my possession. So I'm going to be cataloging all that stuff. And over the next months and year or two, we're going to hopefully get all that stuff transferred and backed up and see what's on there. Nice. And do you know why they're called Earls? No. Fun fact, uh, the, the, that name popped in my head because one of the teas that the maids had stolen to smoke was Earl Grey. Now, you know, <laughs> How did you know they, they smoked? <laughs> I don't know. What? How did you know they were stealing it to smoke? You wouldn't steal it. You wouldn't steal. It. You can go get tea somewhere. They thought we were mu they were musicians. They thought it. They they thought it had to be some sort of drugs that they could resell or smoke. Either way, somebody got a nasty, nasty. Nasty guy. <laughs> Yo, I've known you for 45 years, and that's the longest I've ever seen you speak. That was amazing. <laughs> With that, I'm going to, okay, let's go to Dan for now anyway. I've said well, I mean, I'll keep mine brief anyway, because I'm, oh. I'm I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say, too, because uh, there's a lot with this album. I, At the time when I was <clears throat> growing up, this was my favorite. Um, but I think, I think not Richard, but Dick kind of like uh, became my favorite. But <clears throat> this one, I think, is the most um, eclectic, like genre spanning kind of. Um, I love the production on it. And like like we talked about a couple episodes, like the studio banter. You guys did some back masking on Beige Sunshine. Um, <clears throat> and Anderson Walkman Buttholes and How has always been one of my favorites. I just, <clears throat> we got to play that live or... We played that live a little while back. You know, maybe it was like 10 years ago. It was awesome. Um, you know, I'd have a question about, and <clears throat> I should probably know the answer. I probably already asked. But the, on the lyrics, there's like the song for Michael's Pipe. It's like in another language. Oh, it had something hey. to do yeah. with... Um, it's in Greek. What? Yeah, we went to like Kinko's or something, mm. and on the computer was this like early mm. days of desktop computing or whatever, and there was some like weird font, and I think we typed in I don't know what the words were, but I think that font like turned out all those weird characters. There's actually it's code. There's an alphabet at the bottom. Yeah, I think you can decode it if you want. I did. I, I did it years ago, and I remember it's something like "Song for Michael's Pipe." But what is the like? Where did the words come from? A tech non sporta. Dave Dave Schultz oh, wrote it. Dave, Dave Schultz <laughs> wrote it as uh, a poem. Yeah, and he didn't want it to have music, but it was songs. There was never a, there was never a, um, an intention of having music and having it on the album because i remember being so curious as a teenager being like what the hell is this there's no song on here that has these lyrics <laughs> yeah so we were just doing that to to mess with people but that was <laughs> mess with you dan Necros oh, no. a corpse it. but it has something to do with the but all surfers too i think because they were they had yes. some michael's because they had they had taken their van they <laughs> they were living in uh, um in athens georgia <laughs> around the same time Michael Stipe was. And they took their van and they spray painted on the side, Michael Stipe, despite the hype, you're still cool enough to suck my pipe. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that is why, there's a lot of butthole servers influence on this album, as you'll find out as things move along. And interestingly, the butthole servers recorded one of their most popular albums, Electric Larry Land, at Arlen Studios. Yeah. 
after after we recorded this one. Well, maybe we should jump to one of the topics that I was going to raise, which was Gibby Haynes coming to visit the studio to record. Yes. On air. So uh, maybe somebody can elaborate better than I can, but he showed up wearing an Anderson Walkman, Wakeman and Howe t-shirt for the song. Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman and Howe. He, what had happened was we gave him a call. It was like something out of a cartoon. And all of a sudden, within seconds, we heard tires squealing. He pulled up. <laughs> into the recording studio parking lot and ran out wearing a Anderson, Bruford, Wakeman and Howe shirt. And we said, oh, wow. I just, I was wearing it when you called me. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. that that was kind of freaky. Yeah, that was, not yeah. I mean, there was lots of freaky stuff around that. I think he said that if he'd gotten pulled over on the way over, he was ready to say, Ossifer, my family's involved, which will get you out of anything in Texas. <laughs> so if you get pulled over in Texas, go, Ossifer, my family's involved. Did he write the lyrics? He he came in and he listened to the song, and I and Rodney can clarify, but I think he's like, uh, yeah, I think you told him, can you do something in this section of the song? No, actually, the, the we got to get together. We got that part I wrote, yeah, yeah. and save the snails. That that yeah, I wrote that. But then he added those little bits of just Gibbyisms in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. He spent a yeah, lot he, of time behind the mixing desk with the grease pencil drawing penises on the. Oh paper. yeah, that's right. Yes, he did. And, yeah, and he, and he he got it in the second take. I do remember that. Oh yes. yeah. But <laughs> he also knew that we were. He thought, oh you, oh, so I get it. You're you're kind of making fun of me, aren't you? <laughs> we were. <laughs> Although I will explain that when we get to me, because it does it does loop back to the surface. Dan, are you finished? Oh yeah, no, I'm. I'm I just wanted to hear what you guys have to say. <laughs> so I just had a couple of bullet points. I mean, one is uh, we just talked about Gibby, which was I wanted to bring up, and then um, the second is um, we did a promo item of a Methodist coloring book, which we reprinted for the reissue last year, but I have a copy of it here um, of which my favorite page has always been this one, which is Joe belts it out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to mention uh, for people watching, if you're actually watching and paying attention, the day that this is, posted on YouTube this the Saturday, uh, the 28th of October of uh, 2023. Um, the Giving Group, we, we had a little press overrun of about 80 copies of this uh, coloring book, and they're going to be offering it for sale up on the website. So if you'd like to get a copy of the Methodist coloring book, you can probably click a link, which we'll have uh, down below um, for that. So I wanted to mention that um, my wife did the uh, drawings for that based on the photo uh, photos that were taken at the photo shoot for the video and the video <clears throat> which was submitted to MTV was initially rejected um, because there's some churches in it blowing up and the they only weren't real churches they were models no, we they, know they, were, yeah. they were just models we had like you know yeah, we asked the guys in mayhem to burn down some old churches over <laughs> yeah right um, the only way that MTV, they refused the video, and the only way, way that they would, uh, yeah, they we reversed the footage and it, it imploded instead of exploded. Um, so uh, anyway, and then I was also, I think you mentioned it, Joe, um, we'll provide a link again to my little promo video for, for the re-release of this album um, last year um, uh, about the intro to... Uh, <clears throat> Methodist coloring book where I was out in that sort of unfinished area and an airplane flew over. So those are the things that uh, I wanted to mention. Oh, and one other thing, while I was looking online just to see what was out there about this album, I was surprised to see, has any, did anybody else see, there's a book by an author named Seth Kaufman, also called Metaphysical Graffiti. Um, it's described as, I'll quote, a provocative, entertaining, but ultimately serious examination of rock's most essential questions like Beatles or Stones, which is the best air guitar to play? Does Rush suck? And what is the meaning of Billy Joel? And I'll provide a link to this book, which was published a year or so ago, or a couple years ago, um, and you can read an excerpt and make a decision on whether you think this is um, something you want to read or not. But anyway, uh, that's my comments about the album. So really quick, who came up with the album title? Like, who decided the album title? 
Rod, Rodney came up with the album title while Not that we, clever though. While we were recording it, but I, while we were making the album, um, I don't think I don't even know if we had a working title at all. I um, wanted to call it "Punk's Not Dead," but Limbaugh is, but he was still alive. <laughs> but he was still alive. <laughs> um, very impression. Um, the we on the pre on our Beelzebub tour, we all passed around a book called "Hammer of the Gods." which was a biography of Led Zeppelin. And it's very entertaining. I recommend it. Very entertaining. <laughs> it is. So don't ever read I was kind of. <laughs> I still have it we on my all, shelf. We were inside joking all the time about Led Zeppelin. Yeah. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we, even, we even started to, to um, cover one of their songs uh, periodically. Um. We did South cover Bounce Southbound Square, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, w I was, in the studio, I brought a book. I had a book, which was an overview of philosophy. It was like just a book that maybe a, be a beginning student of philosophy would read. And I I never took philosophy. I didn't know. Roddy knew more about it than me. Dave knew. Dave Schultz knew more. But I was just reading through it. And they, I kept getting quizzed by them. Did you read, <laughs> what, did Kant, what did Kant say about this now? <laughs> what, what is empirical uh knowledge uh i don't know what so <laughs> somehow that became the metaphysics of the the philosophy and one of those things that i was we were discussing and i don't remember i don't even retain any of that stuff it was cartesian dualism <laughs> he called you to throw a beer can at my head <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, we're down to about. Oh, and he came up with the clever pun, metaphysical graffiti. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was wrapped up in uh, cryptids with sexy lady legs. This is, you look, there's, yeah, there we go. Anyway, um, that is, of course, the uh, um, the Flatwoods monster. So, with sexy lady legs. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's great to be on the, the Halloween episode. What, what was the question? Oh, yeah. I thought it was going to be the Halloween thing. So then I got the I got the question and I was disappointed. I'm like, oh. And then I saw that it was uh, Metaphysical Graffiti. And I went, yeah, because a lot of people say it's our best album. And then I gave it a listen. And I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are, just one thing that, that kind of bugs me when you started off is this is when when Joe said we had the most money and time to play with. And when you do that, you start becoming guilty of the things you didn't like. So it begins with a children's choir, which is something so many bands had done before. You know, I, I remember Joe Strummer talking about when they gave them money and they were making like San Denise. He's like, we would spend hours recording like ants eating wood. He's like, just this. <laughs> and just and people, I'm a fan of Dead Can Dance. So, you know, I mean, I understand pretension. But uh, yeah, this was. That was, I think if I redid that, now I want to go into the studio, it's like my job is to stop pretension. So anyway, let's bring in a 20-piece orchestra. Like, maybe we shouldn't. And that should be a lesson for you young people watching this. Just have a guy in the band that goes, maybe not. Sometimes people will talk out of it, like try to talk out of it, like, Dan, you're a big fan of the Kinks. And they'll say, well, the Kinks did this. And I always go, yeah, you know, um, you're a big fan of Ernest Hemingway, and he shot himself, so... <laughs> Putting it out there. All right. Anyway, so now that I got that, but go find the thing about Joe Strummer talking about record them recording ants. So that was my only only problem with that. According to Joe, though, I've got no one to blame because I, I I apparently wrote the beginning for that. Um, songs I can tell you about. Um, Methodist coloring book. This is a revenge song. I got burned. I as you as you may have heard, people. I uh, do not sleep much. I am up oftentimes just roaming the house late at night. Um, and I used to wake up at odd times and turn on the television back in the day of infomercials. And there was, I think it's ETWN or something. It was a Catholic network. And I would tune in regularly because they would have like mass for shut-ins. And it was just people repeating. Mass. And I was raised pretty much secular. We'll get to that in a minute. But I, uh, um, I, I was fascinated by this channel. And one night I was up watching it and they're like, hey. Do you know about Little Ernesto's Catholic coloring book? I'm like, I don't know, but I want to learn. And they're like, it's fun to color and explore our Catholic faith. And I'm like, you're batting about 500. Yeah, so that's where. So I sent away for it. I sent the I sent the Catholic Church. Like, 
I don't know, five or six bucks, which I think was later used for hush money. And um, and I never got anything. I got burned and I got mad. So I thought, well, I didn't want to do Catholic coloring book because it's it's to the hard consonants and stuff. So I called my mom and I said, mom, was I ever baptized? And my mom pointed out something I'd forgotten about, which was when I was young, uh, when they went to enroll you into a, in the school, elementary school, they had to have a baptismal certificate for you. And if they didn't have one, the school would put an I next to your name for illegitimate. That's an absolute, that should be a song. That's an absolute fact, people. You can, yeah, Dan looks horrified. Yeah, Dan, that was that's a real thing. So I was baptized a Methodist, uh, which is not quite Presbyterian, I guess. I don't know. But um, so that's how that song came about. And uh, um, uh, that's actually, I believe, even though they wanted me to play uh, uh, like a B3 organ, that is the mighty DX11, which plays a whole part in the story. I and I still there's have... a B3 organ at the studio. Yes, yeah. thanks. And I still to this day, someone go, "Do you want to use this?" And I'll go, "No, I want to use this." Uh, thanks to one of our um, our regular v uh, viewers, Larry Goldfinger. I have a DX11 now, and I have it all loaded up the way the original one was. So that is a good thing. Uh, except for, and we're about to get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, there's a sound that I've been trying to recreate create ever since. Fortunately, I sampled it. So if you see us live, you hear it. But so that was, um, that's Methodist coloring book. And I still love playing that song today. Um, so up next, do the brown nose. Um, I was sitting around the house one day listening to Archie Bell and the Drells, which I always thought was the weirdest name for a band. Like you would think it'd be Archie Drell and the Bells, but no, it's Archie Bell and the Drells. Like we'll be the Drells. Like they could have come up with so many other things. So I don't even know what a Drell is. And I played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. I can only assume it's some sort of elf. But um, in that song, I thought it was fascinating because the whole thing is the song's tighten it up by Archie Bell and the Drells. And uh, actually, one of the guys at Arlen, um, Archie Bell and the Drells, had played his prom. So he knew what this was. But in Tighten It Up, they spend, like, I'm going to say three quarters of the song, like, explaining the song. All right, now tighten it up. We're going to tighten it. But they never actually take some while to get the song. And I love songs like that, where they would send the whole thing explaining how to do the song, you know, and and, and that's absolutely great. So I, I thought, well, we should definitely do a take on that. Was it? What I was hoping for, I don't know. I think I could have been a little cleverer on that, but I could be a lot cleverer on a lot of things. Um, if you love somebody, set them on fire. Um, as Joe mentioned, appeared on uh, the uh, Sunflower Children of God. Uh, was it uh, 2000 Bong Hits from Home album? Something I'm not particularly proud of, but seems that seems to keep popping up again and again in my life. Um, yeah, I think, like I say, the sun shines out my asshole, which I think was part of the inspiration for um, for Beige Sunshine appears on there. It's it's a it's a weird thing. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll never hear it. Um, now, the thing is, when I did that, um, there was a sound on there that I had created. I, I programmed. It was, it was a proprietary sound for my DX11, and Joe liked the sound of it. Or at least Joe said, it sounds crazy. So that song was cra sound cra called Crazy Joe. Um, unfortunately, when the old battery died, I lost. Now, I have samples of Crazy Joe, but I've spent a lot of my free time trying to recreate Crazy Joe on the DX11. And I will get it someday. But that that's what that that sound is. And then, yeah, so that's the, the mighty DX11. Speaking about the DX11, Anderson Walkman Buttholes and Hal um, uses a bunch of the preset sounds from the D-Bank on the DX11. And now because of Mr. Larry Goldfinger, I have one. So we could do that live with the actual sounds. Although you can get samples of the sounds, but it would be the actual, using the actual synth. Uh, this came about because some prick somewhere was just talking about like, you know, one of those synth players. Like, well, I would never use the presets. And I'm like, not only am I going to use the presets, but I'm going to use the most screwed up presets. Um, the ah. D-Bank is famous for a preset called White Blow, which you would use if you were covering Blasphemous uh, Rumors by Depeche Mode. And it sounds like somebody doing coke. Um, and then that sound, that's actually um, a preset on there called Terror. And I would just go down through, boom, boom, boom. Why are you doing this, you might ask? There was a song by the Butthole Surfers called Lady Snip. And Lady Snip would go, bam, 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 bam. <laughs> but then they would stick all this other stuff in there, like there'd be a guitar solo, uh, samples of Mexican radio. So I was really inspired by that. So I thought, well, make something where it's like, and then you stop and you hit 
one of these presets. So I'm literally, I think, going down in order on the presets. And every last one of them is killer as FM um, synthesizer presets were back in the day. So um, now, one thing we did not mention about the um, album, the models that were used for the front and back are now in the Philadelphia section of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And when I sent them over, uh, our friend George had them. And if he was, he should have just sold them. He could have, he could have raked in the bucks. Um, somebody, when they found out I had them in my house and I was shipping them, offered me money for them. Uh, I said no, but it gave me an idea for how much to insure them for because I had to write out an insurance form when I sent them over. So I insured them for like the maximum that somebody had offered uh, for me. So yeah, so if you go to the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I believe is in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, and you go there to the Philadelphia section, you can see the uh, the models that were used from that. And I think you can see Jackal from Wide Eyes Jacket. There's a lot of a lot of Philly stuff there, but still the rest of the museum, eh, hell hole. So that's pretty much all I can tell you about. And I think that's pretty much a lot to tell you about metaphysical graffiti. Wow. Kind of falls apart as it goes along, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we, we interspersed all those earls in the album and I was expecting them to be hidden tracks. I don't think I really understood how CDs worked, but you apparently I didn't want them to be part of the tracks, which they ended up becoming. And then when, the, when it became an MP3, they were part of the MP3s and that really bugged me, but what can you do? I think we kind of fixed it once we got the rights back. The other thing is that- That really chafed your ass. <laughs> yeah, that really did. And yeah, and the fact that it made the last song really long, and we didn't have enough room to put it, the last one on the vinyl, which the record company really didn't want to make anyway. They didn't want to make vinyl <laughs> uh, back then. <laughs> any questions? Yeah, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. There's a, I can't even like reproduce it with my mouth, but there's like some kind of gibberish talk in the beginning of, um, I think it's I Hate You, I Love You. You know I, don't, what I don't know why that was there. Maybe it was just banner that it's but it's not oh. I don't think it's like word. It's like I was skitzing out. I was skitzing out. That's what I was <laughs> That's just the way people <laughs> in Texas talk. I think that happened when I was getting ready to do a vocal and for some reason they kept it in. And also I broke a string on our take of Methodist coloring book and I wanted to do it again but no that uh, was brian thought it was so great he refused to let us do it again and that's the one with the airplane going ahead and those vocals you just did as like scratch right yeah and i wasn't allowed to even do the vocal again <laughs> so that was a scratch vocal but i guess and i was just i, I was just horsing around not thinking that that was going to be the real take and in I actually wanted Rodney to have to to sing that song, but he never sang it in practice, so he wasn't gonna he wasn't about to sing it in the studio. But I wanted him to. <laughs> he wrote the lyrics for it as he as he mentioned. If I sang it, it would sound very tongue in cheek, as my singing often does. Um, if Joe sang it, it would sound earnest. It would well, be. I thought you know, that yeah. Well, that's. Do you actually go out like? decide in the writing process that joe will sing a song well you know how it works yes now it happens that way i mean you all like i just i wrote the music for it but rodney wrote the words all before the music yeah like how you decide what you're gonna sing rodney versus what you're gonna have joe i use i use the cars method which is uh, rick okasic would say uh yeah if if it's sort of you know snarky and tongue-in-cheek rick would get it if it was more soulful and 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 needed some you know you're straightforward like this is you know i can i can sing then then you know ben Orr would get it joe is joe is the ben Orr. i'm the rick case and up until then any lyric that rodney gave me and i wrote music to he sang and that's that's the way I, I expected it to be i didn't think that there would be that i would end up singing it but he asked me to sing it in practice and i did and then that's the way it was and I didn't expect that to be the video. I just dug up out of my filing cabinet the um, memo, the the 
contract memo that gave the, the rundown, not the whole contract, but for how that worked for, for Enigma, <laughs> our seven record deal that was only one record, but they clearly had the rights to choose the song. We had um, we had very much creative control, but not just choosing the song that they would make the video for. And we had- What would you have chosen? Me, I would, I liked, if you love somebody, set them on fire. I also like Do the Brown News. Somebody at the record company hated Do the Brown News and that was never gonna be the video. And I even complained afterwards. I tried, I tried after they made that decision, I tried to get it changed. I even talked to Adam Bernstein thinking he had some kind of pool, but he didn't. That's the director of the video. And I, I wanted it to be Methodist color. So yeah, so it was three, it was probably three against me. <laughs> wow. Three against How's me. that feel? Three against me. <laughs> kinda, Welcome to my world. Three against me. Let's any more questions or should That's we? it. No, we have are we you in the back there? there? No. A question? <laughs> Point of parliamentary procedure. <laughs> I got all my stuff out that I wanted to get out of. <laughs> I want to recommend... And you'll clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to recommend a movie that came out in the United States in 2018. It was made in 2017. And it's called The King. And this is in response to a comment that somebody made on our previous video about me talking about Elvis. Elvis's first... Elvis being a, a influential performance that talk that to was. me about elvis talk to me about elvis man <laughs> somebody said elvis was a racist you shouldn't pick somebody else maybe that's true but i started looking into it i i don't i was just trying to figure out how elvis is perceived as a racist i know chuck d said he was and this video actually explains chuck d's in this vid, it's a video it's a movie which you can watch on pluto tv with commercials or you can rent it on various platforms and not have commercials <clears throat> Um, it's a documentary that uses archival footage and a lot of interviews of celebrities and people who are around Elvis and even Chuck D's in it a lot talking about Elvis and why he came, w the meaning of the fight the power lyrics. Elvis was a hero to most, but he didn't mean shit to me. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of parallels Elvis, Elvis's career with the fading American dream or the myth of the American dream. So it uses Elvis as a metaphor and everyone's driving around in Elvis's Rolls Royce uh, and they're being interviewed and they are playing music in there. It's, it's kind of cool. I recommend it if you have a couple extra hours and you're interested in the debate over cultural appropriation of music and whether or not Elvis was a, a racist. And I also found out in my research that the reason that a lot of people in the 50s thought he was a racist was that there was a, although they, they might not use the term racist the same way it's used today, was that there was a quote attributed to Elvis, widely disseminated, that turned out not to be, he, he, he claimed he never said it, but it didn't matter. It was, it, it became, it was one of those myths that became fact. And the, the quote basically said, Elvis, uh, Elvis being asked what he thought of the black people. He's, and he said something like the Negro n means nothing to me, except for someone who could buy my, they can shine my shoes or buy my records. And otherwise it's a really terrible quote, but that's why today he was nominated as Republican speaker of the house. <laughs> but he, 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 he claimed he never made the quote. Um, I looked it up on S in Snopes. They say fact check false. Yeah. He never said that. And why, but why would somebody want him to have said it? It's almost, it's probably because there are certain people that didn't like the mix, race mixing that was happening at concerts, especially, and it, black black people went to Elvis concerts too, at least in the early days. But this quote was, came out in 57, the fake quote. And then after that, not only was Elvis toned down, well, he went to the, he was drafted, 
but I think there are there, there's something more to it. I, maybe even Colonel Tom Parker is involved with it. I don't know. I I couldn't tell you, but I'll, I'll have a link to the Snopes. I recommend reading the whole Snopes article. It's it's pretty in depth and explains a lot. And also this documentary called The King. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah, didn't Elvis attend like black church services when he was younger? And yes, and that's that's mentioned. You, you can see that in in both the documentary and in the Snopes uh, review of the quote. But and NBC he was, was a very humble person. Nazis. <laughs> yeah. But you also get to see what why Chuck D calls him a racist. I see that in the King in the in the documentary called The King. Oh, the comment section's going to be full of geniuses now. I know. Who reads the comments? <laughs> no one reads the comments. But I read them last week. <laughs> that, that was Yeah, I, I saw that one. I thought about that. Was gonna, yeah. Um, I would like to recommend a, sorry, an album <clears throat> off of this website, Bandcamp. Um, the guy's name is Chris Oliver, and he's someone that we met in detroit or hamtramck a few months ago or about a month and a half ago um he just was walking and he just came up and was like hey just wanted to say i really liked your i tripped over the auto and i was like oh wow i haven't heard that ever <laughs> um and we were just talking and then we just kind of just kept talking and he seemed he was a really cool guy and he had a uh joe and i signed his cast did you guys sign his cast he had a leg cast he had a he had, his foot had, had been broken and he was getting the cast off in a couple of weeks but he made he makes music and he makes he made an album with his broken foot the one i want to recommend is called adams i don't think his foot was broken at the time that he recorded it but it was uh when he put it out like a, a three or four weeks ago it's really good. Check it out. Um, it's kind of, and he does everything himself too, which is cool drums and guitar and bass, keyboards. So, yeah, I'll put a link. Yeah. By the way, I tripped over the Ottoman. Uh, inspiration for that is uh, obviously the Dick Van Dyke show. But when I was in high school, I had a girlfriend who was obsessed with the Dick Van Dyke show and was convinced that the Dick, Dick Van Dyke and Laura Petrie were swingers because they would have these parties and she would come out to leotard stuff and she would go like, every guy at this party looks like Lenny Bruce. And she was right. So, yeah. So that's why I was obsessed with the uh, with uh, Dick Van Dyke and still is still obsessed with that show. Um, I would like to recommend, uh, I, I may have recommended this YouTube channel before. It's a YouTube channel called Great Art Explained. Um, it's run by a fellow named James Payne, who is a curator, a uh, gallerist, and art lover. Um, and he uh, aims to demystify the art world and discover the stories behind the world's greatest paintings and sculptures. And each painting usually... Uh, focuses on one piece of art or an artist and he, he breaks it down and um you know he kind of puts it in plain words he, he gets rid of all the sort of pretentious art speak um the particular episode i'm going to link to is a recent one that he did about the artist keith herring um and i think you should check it out um keith herring was a artist in the uh sort of 70s and 80s um, you're probably, if you're watching this channel, you're very familiar with his work. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, sadly he, um, he contracted AIDS. He was a, a big activist with ACT UP. And, um, so it's a very, uh, interesting and, uh, it's kind of a moving episode. I, I, I suggest you check it out. It's called, um, it's Keith Haring, Great Art Explained. I love that channel. I, yeah. I, I watch them all the time. And yeah, because it's always like, I always have to explain to people like, but, oh, my kid could do that. I'm like, no, your kid could, but if your kid does it, I'll buy it. Um, okay, so first of all, happy Halloween, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed our super scary Halloween episode. I'd like to thank Delbert McClinton and Charo for stopping by. <laughs> uh, all right, so I'm going to recommend this. You saw me with it earlier. This is um, Cryptids with Sexy Lady Legs, um, a book that my wife picked up from uh, someone who works at the co-op where we shop. Uh, her name is um, 
Ashley Anathema. Uh, there it is. There, uh, you can you can go find her on Instagram and follow her. But it's a really but this is the squonk, which is the official cryptid of Pennsylvania. So I just I was so happy. I, this is like I think my wife gave her six dollars and sixty six cents for this. But yeah, <laughs> if you can get a hold of a copy of this, do it because it's really it's a fun thing to leave laying out and people go, okay. So and I've been writing songs about cryptids for a while now, so that's good. All right, so. Halloween time. Um, it used to be Halloween time. We all went out and we soaked windows and we we threw corn in houses. That would get you shot now. Everybody's armed. Um, so what do you do? So this is my suggestion. I came up with this today. This you're gonna need you and a friend, like you would for for you know Halloween pranks in the day, a sort of mischief night thing. Um, get like uh WhatsApp or the the vaguely racist next door app. Get one of those. You and your friend create an account somewhere on there. All right. And it doesn't matter if it's for your neighborhood or whatever. Just each of you create an account. All right. The same for the same area. Now, and, and I would not use my my real name for this if I were you. Um, first one goes on. And you got to say something like like a distinctive name. Like, I would like to thank Herbert Lipinski of Monroe Street for helping me pick up my garbage when some dogs drug it all over the street. OK, that's it. Simple post. Then about five, ten minutes later. Maybe let some people go on and say how nice it is or whatever. Have your buddy go on and say, look, I got to tell you this straight out. Herbert Lipinski died nearly 20 years ago in a house fire. You're not <laughs> the first person to encounter his spirit. Just do it. Just do it. There are variations you can do it. I, I recommended this to somebody and they've been doing it for a while. <laughs> and, and I can tell, too, when I see one, it's like, I would like to thank Officer Herb Lekinski, who helped me with my flat tire. I'm like, oh, here it comes. So, yeah, just do, do it, folks, and, and have fun with it. Play around with it. All right, it's time to get the impossible box uh, and pick uh, your the last, because this is a, uh, the last of our October shows. Um, but the uh, um, some people say, well, what makes you an expert in horror movies, Rodney Anonymous? Well, I own a piece of the Rustin Parr house. Uh, from the Blair Witch Project, which Joe saw with me and my wife. And uh, this has actually been screen verified. They tore it down. And when they tore it down, uh, some people managed to get a hold of parts of it. And I was one of those people. So this is for Halloween, an actual part of the Rustin Bar House, which appears in the Blair Witch. All right. So here comes your movie. Getting the impossible box. Ooh, I'm so excited. This is always, this is, always, it's easier than voting for Speaker of the House because, you know, no election deniers in this. Uh, okay, and let me get this open. Ah, and can I see what it is? I don't think I can. Drum roll, Dean. Oh, Living Dead in the Manchester Moor. Oh, this is a good one. Uh, this is a very 70s zombie movie, which begins with nudity. Uh, the hero is a bit of a jerk. Uh, it is, there, there's drug use in it. Uh, of course, it's, I think it's from 74. It is one of the most 70s, uh, other than Children Should Play With Dead Things, one, or 72 maybe, one of the most 70s movies that you're going to see. But The Living Dead at the Manchester Morgue is quite a trip. And if you like to see a movie that starts with a naked woman running across the traffic in Manchester, <laughs> you're going to like this film. <laughs> it's a real movie. <laughs> all right thank you everybody all right happy halloween. halloween i say have a happy and safe halloween but a safe halloween isn't any fun go go put firecrackers in pumpkins or something i'm gonna get sued aren't i well it'll be split four ways i can afford it all right i'll see you guys later. bye